So uh, today, I, uh, uh, myself and uh, Mara Brunjikji are going to talk about mass independent fractionation of oxygen isotopes in the atmosphere. I'm going to start out the presentation. Uh, I'm, uh, we're both at the uh, School of Earth and Space Exploration, at Arizona State. Mara is a third year graduate student working with me. And uh, I'm going to start out the presentation giving a brief overview and a discussion of the lower atmosphere. Mara will then talk about the upper atmosphere and some recent results she has. Okay, so uh, a brief history, but I'm going to keep this very brief because, in fact, uh, some of this has already been discussed. But I, I want, there are two things I wanted to mention. Uh, one is that Conrad Mauersberger uh, in 1981 discovered, uh, using a, bland, uh, a balloon borne mass spectrometer, uh, enrichments in stratospheric ozone. They were too high, as it turns out, but uh, by about a factor of three or four. But but he did discover this uh, the uh, the uh, high enrichment in ozone, uh, and then he also made absolutely essential measurements of isotopic rate coefficients for ozone formation for the various isotopomers of ozone, and uh, that was in 1999. And those uh, measurements, laboratory measurements, were they form the basis for the Marcus theory for explaining uh, what's going on with uh, ozone formation, the uh, chemical physics of it. Okay, so a few equations, but uh, don't be alarmed. Um, I know uh, most of you don't see these, so I will just explain what they are. For the atmosphere, we, we need them. They're essential. Uh, so one thing we're going to solve here is the continuity equation, and this is just the basic uh, continuity equation. It's uh, applied in all aspects of physics, and uh, it's for uh, conserved species that have sources and sinks. So uh, just number density, flux, time, and we're going to look at a vertical gradient, and then production and loss chemically. Okay, uh, And this is the expression for the diffusion flux, and these are scale heights down here, and uh, Mara is going to talk more about all that. For the lower atmosphere, we do not care about these terms. These are molecular diffusion. We only care about the well-mixed part of the atmosphere, and that actually simplifies the equation quite a bit. And we only have a single scale height in that case, for most species at least. OK, so what we, what we do here uh, is we look at, uh, we want to simulate, because this is difficult to measure. Uh, you know, many of the species have been measured, but not all of them. Radicals are tough to measure uh, oxygen isotope composition for. So we do have to do calculations to uh, try to predict what the compositions are for the atmosphere. And uh, we do that in, uh, in this form. There have been many examples of this. I, I'm just uh, giving you kind of the, the basic overview. This is the ozone formation reaction, all gas phase kinetic reactions, uh, and uh, the various isotopomers of ozone that can form where Q is 18O and P is 17O, or however you want to define it. Uh, but there's a, an asymmetric isotopomer, and there's a symmetric isotopomer, and this is uh, key to uh, the uh, Marcus mechanism for understanding ozone mass independent fractionation. Okay, photodissociation reactions also play a role, of course, and uh, ozone is readily dissociated. And uh, as a first uh, approximation, we assume that uh, the same photodissociation rate coefficient applies for all of the isotopomers apart from factors of uh, a half where there's a branching that can occur because of, for example, this one, you can either uh, dissociate this end uh, 18O or uh, this one, the 16O. Okay, so accounting for all of that and then including isotopic exchange reactions, which for oxygen are very important in Earth's atmosphere because O atoms, atomic oxygen, exchanges very rapidly with O2 and O2, of course, is the primary reservoir of oxygen uh, by far. So uh, these exchange reactions must be included. And they're so fast, in fact, that we can literally just write them uh, in terms of equilibrium uh, rate constants and uh, the uh, measured uh, rate constant, the kinetic rate constant. Um, OK, so we'll define delta values in this way. These are in, in brackets. These are concentrations. So the delta value for this little delta uh, either 17 or 18 for symmetric ozone is uh, as written here, okay? And uh, same for asymmetric ozone. And then uh, you can define a total ozone as well by summing those. Now, we, we departed slightly from uh, what all of you have been doing. We defined cap delta 17 O in, I guess I would call it the earlier incarnation of its definition in this manner. Uh, and uh, so we did not use the delta prime notation. And uh, it, it, it be, you're going to see that some of the fractionations we're talking about are gigantic. So in fact, the values would change dramatically. 
But uh, just so you know, we're, and in most cases, we're 0.528. Where we're not, I'm, uh, I will indicate uh, that. Okay, so uh, I mentioned those Mauersberger rate coefficients for ozone isotopomer formation. They're shown here, and I'm uh, not going to go into all the details of this. It, it really requires that you sit down and, and look at it for a while. He did not measure everything. Uh, they uh, measured a, a you know, good, important fraction of what was needed. But uh, theory then, uh, and this is the Marcus theory, came in to fill in uh, some of the missing data. Okay, And there's some variation in that. And again, I'm not going to go through all the details of this theory. Uh, uh, I will say one thing though, somebody did ask about uh, the temperature dependence of, uh, here's the, the eta, this eta effect, the, the Marcus, uh, what I call a non-statistical theory. Uh, that, that temperature dependence for ozone formation is primarily uh, because there's a competition between the energy transfer formation reaction and the chaperone formation reaction. And at high temperatures, the energy transfer wins and it has a much higher mass independent anomaly. Okay, so we also, to model uh, atmospheric constituents, we have to account for exchange reactions, and there are many. And this is, this is circa 2001. Uh, there has been some update of this, but uh, surprisingly, a, a lot has not been done uh, on this front. And, uh, and they're fairly straightforward measurements, but uh, it's, it just hasn't quite caught on, I guess. <clears throat> so there are many species, especially if you're talking about chlorine compounds or sulfur compounds, that uh, for which we, we really do not know much about the, uh, the various uh, exchange reactions that can occur. And they make a big difference. I mentioned the, the OO2 exchange. There should be a 2 there on that uh, O, so that's O plus O2 uh, exchange. And, uh, but you see there's interaction between many of these species. So the OH radical exchanges with water, that's very important in the troposphere. You can get exchange between uh, some of the HOX compounds and uh, some of the NO and NO2 compounds and many others. It's a, a very long list and a very incomplete list. And you'll see some of these only have upper rate coefficients. Some of them are known, some are not uh, known all that well. Uh, and it, it represents a major source of uncertainty in terms of uh, cap delta 17 values for atmospheric species, especially, again, as I mentioned, radicals. Okay, so this is uh, following, uh, I modified this figure a small bit from my uh, 2001 paper, uh, computing the cap delta 17 values for various atmospheric species. So this goes from zero to 60 kilometers. Uh, somewhat uh, optimistically because the troposphere is very complicated and there's really, uh, a, a, I only barely touched on the, what uh, chemistry goes on there. But uh, these are the measured ozone values measured from uh, some of the uh, German uh, groups and uh, in the stratosphere and troposphere, measurements from the Thiemens group as well in the troposphere, uh, measurements of hydrogen peroxide, and then uh, model values, so O3, uh, OH, which is one that I uh, particularly want to highlight because this is stratospheric OH and we predict, and I was predicting that uh, stratospheric water should be, uh, should have a non, a positive cap delta 17 value. Uh, and, and then uh, various other species. And again, with the chlorine compounds, we've barely touched the, the surface of this. It's, there's, there's still a lot to do there. Okay, a few other uh, results from the same model. The, NO, the CO2 is not from uh, that model, that's from uh, measurements. I just include it there for completeness. But uh, there's the same general idea, nitric uh, acid and uh, nitrous acid and methyl peroxy nitrate, just representing a, a whole family of nitrate compounds. Uh, and there are, again, this is just the surface of them. There are many of them, but they all are expected to uh, be enriched. But again, I don't have exchange reactions here because I don't know them for, for most of these compounds. Uh, so it's it, highly uncertain in that sense. Okay, so then uh, some work, uh, I'll just briefly go over I, a select uh, work that has gone on since 2006 or 2005, roughly. Uh, this is not going to be complete at all, uh, but uh, just to give you a few highlights. Uh, so Zahn et al, in, uh, with uh, I think Thomas Ruckman, uh, did some calculations of uh, radical species again, uh, more or less uh, repeating what I did a, a, you know, a little better. And they got similar results. They found OH uh, enriched, predicting again OH enriched in 17O. That OH is important because OH in the stratosphere reacts with methane. It forms water. That's the primary source of water production in the stratosphere. And uh, if the OH has a positive 
positive cap delta 17 signature, then we would predict that the stratospheric water will also. Uh, that's just a balance between the in situ production of water in the stratosphere versus transport of water uh, in, you know, past the uh, cold trap and into the stratosphere from the troposphere. Okay, so uh, what else uh, has been going on? Uh, a great deal, as it turns out. Uh, some uh, very interesting work on tropospheric CO2. This is from uh, Hogue et al. 2005, Christy Boring's group. They were uh, accounting for CO2 transport down from the stratosphere. And as has been mentioned in one of the other talks, there is a uh, CO2 in the stratosphere represents a large cap delta 17 positive uh, reservoir. And some of that trickles down into the troposphere. And uh, when accounting for all, for all of the uh, activities of CO2 in the biosphere, um, one can uh, predict, this is model prediction, that there will be cap delta 17 values that are non-zero and uh, in fact, uh, measurably high, I would say. So they, you can use this as a, another measure of uh, GPP, global uh, primary productivity. Uh, and uh, this is a, a 3D model. Now, this one is from Coren et al. Let's see, Coren et al. is, uh, that's Thomas Workman's group uh, again. And they did a full 3D model of these processes and showing the uh, hemispheric variation, seasonal variation in the northern hemisphere versus uh, uh, typically a much weaker variation in the southern hemisphere. Okay, and the values have come down a bit. Uh, they're using a different uh, lambda. And, but same idea, it's still, it's uh, uh, values are lower than Hogue at all, but, but they're still there and real and measurable. Okay, so uh, some work on uh, nitrate. This is NO2 specifically. NO2 shows a, <clears throat> uh, let's see, and this is from Moran et al, uh, Joel Severino's group. This uh, NO2 is showing a strong diurnal variation in its cap delta value. So varying from a minimum around noon at about uh, 28 or so per mil up to values as high as uh, over 40 per mil, depending on whether a kinetic model is used or a simpler model. But uh, this, this variation uh, is just representing the fact that here uh, NO2 is produced primarily by reaction with ozone, whereas here it's produced by reaction with other species that are not enriched in oxygen 17. And here is a full 3D uh, model for the lower troposphere of nitrate reactions. This is uh, quite an impressive calculation from Becky Alexander's group in 2020 of earlier this year. And they see uh, large uh, nitrate values, uh, cap delta values in uh, over continental regions ex and over some ocean regions, most ocean regions as well, but not over the Amazon. So over the Amazon and over highly forested regions, you are uh, the NOx chemistry is modified by reaction with uh, terpenes and isoprenes. And, uh, and you get dramatically lower values. So these are as low as you know, four per mil cap delta, whereas these can be as high as 33 or so per mil. So huge variation associated with uh, uh, carbon flux, organic carbon flux from the biosphere. And then finally, I'm gonna mention, uh, there's a lot of work uh, done on sulfate. I think this was already discussed a bit, but not this figure. This is from Martin and Bindemann, 2009. Uh, sulfate oxidation, SO2 oxidation to form sulfate occurs by a whole series of reactions, a variety of reactions. And uh, one can, uh, if one is looking at volcanic plumes and these are uh, tufts, various tufts uh, from with the ages indicated here, uh, you can uh, go through, measure the cap delta 17 of the sulfate and estimate the amount of ozone contribution to this, uh, to that sulfate and how much uh, that uh, volcanic eruption brought down global uh, ozone. Okay, so with that quick overview, I'm gonna stop the share and pass the talk off to um, my colleague and first author, Mara Brinjikri. Hi everyone, I'm gonna talk to you about the mass independent fractionation of oxygen, oxygen isotopes in the atmosphere, specifically the upper atmosphere of Earth. So our motivation for this project is really that the abundances of oxygen isotopes above 100 kilometers in Earth's atmosphere is not well known. There have been some projects going up to about 60 kilometers, but not beyond. So therefore we are uncertain of the processes affecting isotopic composition of the thermosphere. When this is well understood for Earth, we can put other solar system values in context. For example, um, in the future, MAVEN values will be hopefully be released. Um, oxygen isotope values from, from MAVEN, and we could compare these to um, the MAVEN values from Mars's atmosphere. 
first a little bit of background on Earth's atmosphere. So the uh, boundary between the lower atmosphere of the Earth and the upper atmosphere of the Earth or the thermosphere is what we call the homopause. This represents a transition between the well-mixed atmosphere below and the atmosphere dominated, dominated by molecular diffusion above. Um, in the thermosphere, the generation of hot oxygen atoms due to far UV and extreme UV heating of oxygen and nitrogen is what creates the high temperatures there. Um, and since molecular diffusion is a mass dependent and temperature dependent process, molecular diffusion will dominate the transport and mass, of mass, mass dependent fractionation will result. So we are using two different methods in order to model Earth's uh, thermosphere and to determine the theoretical delta values in Earth. The first model is a simple isothermal approximation um, using only diffusion to approximate the behavior. And the second model is the, a, full, a more full treatment using the Vulcan photochemical code. So these are the governing atmospheric equations. Uh, my co-author showed you most of these equations. We have the continuity equation, which is what we're solving for basically. Um, for each species in the atmosphere. And um, we have our diffusive flux equation, which is um, a helpful condition to, set, to uh, solve the atmosphere. And for the lower atmosphere, uh, we cared more about the, this factor here. But in the upper atmosphere, molecular diffusion dominates, which is this factor D and this equation. Um, and that is what will be important in the upper atmosphere. So here are the um, initial number density results from our simple isothermal model with diffusion. So this is again, only using diffusion to approximate um, the behavior of oxygen atoms. And the temperature is approximated as constant T equals 500 Kelvin, which is not accurate. Um, this also approximate a constant eddy diffusion coefficient. Um, so these profiles do not reflect the actual own oxygen number densities, but um, the behavior is what we care about. And what we see here is that you can see a slope shift from um, where it should be below the homopause and above the homopause. But since this is not fully accurate, the homopause is actually around 200 kilometers instead of 100 kilometers where it should be. Um, so then we use the Vulcan a 1D photochemical kinetics code which was originally developed for high temperature exoplanet atmospheres, um, but it is readily adaptable uh, because it is highly general and we can use it for low temperature atmospheres like uh, solar system planets. So what we did was we adapted Vulcan to the earth thermosphere and ionosphere with the inclusion of oxygen isotopes and oxygen and nitrogen ion reactions. So, <clears throat> so for our Vulcan model, um, it utilizes a uh, a more accurate uh, profile for temperature profile for the Earth and an accurate eddy diffusion coefficient that varies with height. You can see the temperature profile here. And we have um, the number density uh, of O atoms here on the right. And you can see here that the Holman pause actually is in the correct location around 100 kilometers, which is where the slope shifts. So now we have our results. First, we have the delta 17O and delta 18O results. Um, and so we first saw the results from the isothermal diffusion model only. And these results were then verified by our Vulcan model. And we saw enormous massive depletions of both 17O and delta 18O um, when, as you go up to 500 kilometers in the atmosphere. So the delta values from diffusion theory are depleted by about uh, minus 100 per mil more than the Vulcan results. Um, but these, both of these models show evidence of diffusive separation above the homopause. So um, the diffusion theory model is, again, for an isothermal atmosphere, so it does not have the correct location of the homopause. It's up here instead of over here. Um, but we see that the behavior is uh, verified in the Vulcan model, that there are massive depletions when you take into account photochemistry, chemistry, and ion chemistry. So then we have our uh, kappa delta 17O results. Um, and what we have here are showing 
the cap delta 17O with two different salt factors. The more general or the more um, classic definition of 0.528 in the dark blue and um, a new definition of 0.5, which I'll explain in a little bit in the light cyan, uh, the cyan color. And what we found is that using the more uh, accepted 0.528 slope factor, uh, we saw a massive enrichment in cap delta 17 of about 40 per mil. And this is unexplainable to us. We're, so we redefined um, the slope factor to 0.5 and saw a behavior closer to the, the most more expected mass dependent um, del uh, cap delta 17 of zero. So in the upper atmosphere, it seems that defining cap delta 17 with a slope of 0.5 instead of 0.528 better describes mass dependent behavior. This 0.5 factor is derived from behavior due to molecular diffusion, while the 0.528 factor is derived from the zero point energies of the isotopes. So what we have here is a little explanation of where we derived this factor from. We start with um, diffusive, the equation uh, for number density from the, the diffusive equilibrium. Um, and this only is only taking into account the molecular diffusion because we're caring about high in the atmosphere where, where molecular diffusion dominates. So from this equation going down here, when you define uh, the delta values, you want to take a ratio of the uh, minor isotope and then the major isotope on the bottom. When you do that, you have this uh, difference in the scale heights that appears. And what that turns out to be is G over KT. And then there's this mass dependent factor here. Going down here, again, defining the delta values. When you take the ratio, basically what you end up with is all the stuff canceling and you end up with only the mass factor remaining. So you have 17 minus 16 over 18 minus 16 and you end up with a slope factor of 0.5. So what we concluded is that modeling capital 17 O um, for, the lower, for the, lower, the lower atmosphere of Earth um, will require completely accounting for mass dependent behavior and kinetics, especially for ozone and the species it influences isotopically and performing more laboratory measurements to determine exchange reaction rates. For the upper atmosphere, at 500 kilometers, the delta 17 O and delta 18 O values are massively depleted in the model by hundreds of per mil. The diffusion of isotopes in the thermosphere follows mass dependent behavior with a fractionation law that has a slope of 0.5 instead of 0.528. Um, and this may have important implications to understanding the oxygen isotopes in the Martian atmosphere, which is what we are actively investigating now. Thank you for listening. If you have any questions. Thank you, Maram. Any question for Jim, Kimara? No questions are in the chat. So I'm quite uh, amazed how the how large frictionations are in the upper atmosphere. Uh, Mara, you can go ahead and turn your camera on. I apologize. I totally forgot to turn on my camera <laughs> in, in my part of the talk, and I think it caused you. So you, feel free. Like to I forgot as well. <laughs> that was it. I, I have a question. To you, it's it's well something that I did not really get is, uh, I mean, why do you think? I mean, the cap delta seventeen itself is not, I mean, it's not meaning anything. So if you take a different slope and you have this massive fractionation in in uh, delta eighteen, of course you get large deviations in the cap delta seventeen. And I think it's uh, you know we've seen in previous talks that the mass fractionation law is somewhere between zero point five and zero point five three. So it's yeah. it, I mean, exactly true. I yeah. mean, we're, we're just pointing out that this is gravity. And uh, so let's say we look at Mars for a second. And, and Mara, do you want to answer that? I don't want to take your. Uh, your um, I think you, you have an idea of where you're going. <laughs> <laughs> OK, um, the uh, so for Mars, we know there is active oxygen escape for, for Earth. There is, too, but it's not consequential to the balance of oxygen in Earth's atmosphere. But for Mars, it is over mm -hmm. time. And so uh, if we are comparing, say, secondary minerals in Martian meteorites, cap delta values of those using 0.528, the usual type value, with a process that is actually uh, fractionating oxygen in the upper atmosphere of Mars and then escaping with a 
0.500 or something like that. Um, there, there is room for misinterpretation. <laughs> so we, we, mm. we need to be careful. That's, that's why we're trying to understand this is really most important for Mars. I mean, mm. this is a prediction for Earth, but I think it's a pretty uh, solid prediction. But obviously, it needs to be measured. We, we, mm. No one's measured these isotopes so, so high in Earth's atmosphere. Mm. Okay, yeah, thanks. Some other questions from the audience? So uh, Ilya, that, that is diffusive separation. That's the effect of gravity. It, yeah. Over that distance, huge, huge effect. That's remarkable. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you. Thank okay, you both. Thank you.